I'm going to give you a perfect example. We worked on a job recently in which there was a professional practice and they had outside service fees. As you probably know, outside service or casual labor are frequently those payments that a business makes to individuals for services that are not necessarily salaried employees. For instance, when a lawyer is paid by a business, they're generally paid and classified either as legal or outside service. Or, or an accounting accountants are paid as accounting expense or outside service. Or it may be the business just hired some casual labor, some temporary labor, and they didn't put them, right, wrong, and different, as salary and had payroll taxes. Please take a moment to write down Lawline.com's second verification code. Lawline.com's second verification code is ORDER, all in lowercase, O-R-D-E-R, -E ORDER. But these people worked on a short-term project and they worked independently and they met all the criteria for independent contractor status and they were properly classified as independent contractors. So we were looking at this, this professional practice and it had a very large amount of money for um, outside service. And when we went to look at the general ledger, we really saw that the, the variance that was exposed by comparing one year to the other wasn't because they had hired more casual labor. It actually was because they were buying certain items that they just threw into casual labor just to get the deduction. In this particular instance, these items were vintage wines. And one of the business owners was actually collecting wine, deducting it as a business expense, and he had in his home a nice cellar of expensive wine. The bottom line is, is that th this whole understanding of, the, of, 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 of financial statements you know, is it's to try to get you to that point so that you can understand what's happening and be able to move backwards if necessary to identify the transactions that comprise those, those figures. Okay. A couple, a couple of things that I just want to mention um, before we conclude today. First of all, if you remember we talked about the balance sheet, we said that the balance sheet is comprised of a current and non-current section. Now, in the liability section, you may have a liability. Let's say you borrowed $12,000 and you only pay $1,000 back each year. The current liability section of the balance sheet will have $1,000. But then you'll also have another loan payable in the long-term section of the balance sheet that will be $11,000. Together, you have the $12,000 that you borrowed. But it's represented separately. It's identified and presented separately because, again, we want to show what portion is going to be paid within the current period, the next 12 months, and what period, and then the balance, uh, you know, greater than 12 months. Okay? Um, you may have noticed that we haven't really talked much today about what type of entity we're talking about. It could be a corporation. It could be a partnership. It could be a, a sole proprietor. And the reason we don't talk much about it in, in this context is because it really has no significance. Virtually 99% of what we're talking about today is really reflective of or, or independent of what type of entity we're operating the, the, the business from. But let's talk about the differences for just a moment. If we are a corporation, the equity section of the balance sheet is comprised of common stock, additional paid in capital, uh, treasury stock, right? we said that before, and retained earnings. If we have a partnership, the equity section of the account of the accounts is is comprised of what we call capital accounts. And so we don't necessarily have the three different sections or subcategories that we just discussed in the form of a corporation. And in a sole proprietorship, the, the, the equity section is, is called proprietorship, very similar to the capital accounts, in which there aren't multi 
a multi um, categories comprising total equity. But that really, in a nutshell, is the only difference in the accounting records that you will see as it as it applies to um, the equity the equity section of a balance sheet. We would be remiss in talking about financial statements if we didn't discuss the difference between a capital asset and a and an expense. In theory, items that are expensed are those items that are purchased and have no life greater, no useful life greater than the year that they we're talking about. In other words, when you buy office supplies, that is going to be generally used within the year, so we expense it. But if you were to purchase equipment, furniture, fixtures, automobiles, trucks, real estate, those items are not deducted on the tax return as an expense. These items are capitalized and included in the fixed asset section of the balance sheet. Now, obviously that creates a, a certain amount of concern because business owners obviously want to get some benefit from buying assets to run their business. Because we know that the that the net income from a business is determined based upon the revenues less the expenses. So if all of the assets that we purchase are recorded on the balance sheet and don't hit or not reflected on the income statement, then theoretically you wouldn't get a deduction for those purchases. So what the way we do get a deduction is by having what we call an, a depreciation or amortization. Depreciation generally refers to the allocation, the proration cost of a fixed asset over its useful life. Amortization refers to the prorated or the, the amortization of the uh, of an intangible asset that is over its useful life. So what this really means is this. If you buy f furniture for the business and you buy it for $10,000, that $10,000 is recorded as a fixed asset. But you're allowed an allowance under a straight line method, if it's 10-year property, of $1,000 a year. So the, you would get a deduction, a depreciation deduction, as, as part of your general administrative expenses on your income statement for $1,000. And your balance sheet would have the cost of the, of the uh, furniture of $10,000 less an allowance for depreciation of $1,000, yielding a net fixed asset figure of $9,000. Here we go again. We talked about this a little bit before this concept. We now have another contra account on the balance sheet. And this contra account keeps on growing every year because every year, under the straight line method of depreciation, if we have something that's worth, uh, going to be uh, useful over 10 years, and you buy it for $10,000, you have $1,000 a year depreciation. Every year, you will get an increase or depreciation adjustment of $1,000. At the end of 10 years, the fixed asset, the furniture, will be worth nothing. Now, I don't want to mis mis mislead you at all. I use the 10 years for furniture strictly for um, illustration purposes. Let me express to you normally how assets are depreciated. Machinery and equipment are generally depreciated on a five-year basis. Furniture and fixtures are generally depreciated on a seven-year basis. Real estate, the building only, not the land portion, is generally depreciated between a 29 and 40 year period, depending upon whether it's residential or uh, commercial real estate. The point is, is that the business gets a deduction for its pro rata share of the cost of these capital assets over their useful life. If this was a tax course, we would talk about the accrued, the, the modified um, accelerated depreciation methods, but it's really above and beyond discussion here. Maybe another time we'll discuss that. But the point is, is that when you buy an asset, and the asset has to be recorded on the balance sheet because it has a useful life of one year, of more than one year, it is prorated over its useful life, and that prorated portion is not only recorded 
on the income statement as depreciation or amortization expense, but also at the con on the balance sheet as a contra asset to the asset that it relates to. So there you have it. We've talked about the three different types of statements that are normally found in the financial statement, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the statement of cash flows. We've talked a little bit about footnotes and what they mean and how, and how they are very helpful for you to understand uh, what a financial statement really means. We very quickly went through that the accounting records stem from some, some very unsophisticated books and records to a whole detailed general ledger and a trial balance that help us form the financial statement. And obviously we talked about some exercises you may want to employ to really get an understanding of how the business is performing and if the numbers may or may not be right. Some of this information may lend itself to allow you to do this by yourself, but for many of you it may also just teach you that perhaps you should um, retain someone with a greater area of expertise in accounting to help you if that's what, what, what your case desires. Thank you very much.